Could you define dissociation and then share your perspective on whether it is helpful, aka desirable or undesirable in the in the effects that we see, the antidepressant effects? You know, sometimes I have started papers on dissociation and stopped because I would get hung up on what the definition of dissociation is. Hmm. Our consciousness, our experience of the world, our sense of ourself in the world, our sense of our bodies, our sense of ourselves embedded in time, all of these things which people take for granted are constructions of our brain, active constructions. And when these fundamental aspects of the organization of consciousness are perturbed, we experience ourselves as disconnected from ourselves, in other words, depersonalized, or in an artificial state, which is also called derealization. In other words, that you're in an altered reality. And those states of derealization and depersonalization, as well as distortions in our perception of ourselves and the perception of the world as integrated, are collectively what we tend to refer to as dissociative states. Because Dissociation meaning disconnected from what's going on around us. But really, it's a much more profound and nuanced idea because you can have some distortion of dissociation in some dimensions and not others, and it can be very nuanced. I got interested in dissociation because of working with Vietnam veterans with post traumatic stress disorder and for whom. Dissociation is a complication or a part of the syndrome of post-traumatic stress disorder for many people. And it's a whole nuanced range of things from these states of feeling disconnected and, and that things are not real to sensory distortions to what people know as a very dramatic aspect of PTSD, which are these flashbacks where people are completely absorbed in another state and lose touch with what's happening around them. And so one of the things that was exciting about the initial ketamine research was that it was not only providing us a way, a new way to think about the neurobiology of psychosis and cognitive impairments associated with schizophrenia, but it was also at the same time providing us with really the first pure kind of neurobiological path to studying the neurobiology of dissociation and PTSD. And that's a whole other kind of discussion which we can we can come back to. So what about dissociation in the antidepressant effects of ketamine? This is really an interesting and complicated question because to really answer your question, you have to acknowledge, I have to acknowledge that I'm a translational neuroscientist and psychiatrist. I do work on trying to understand the most basic aspects of biochemistry, synaptic signaling, network function, computational modeling, whatever. And so there are aspects of engaging in treatment that are not so close to that. Like, what did it mean to me to go through this experience? And, and so a lot of people say that the dissociative experience is a very meaningful experience for them, uh, particularly if there's some kind of guided experience to do that. And I have no argument with that whatsoever. Why not? In fact, that's great. But I've seen a lot of people who get ketamine for treatment and a lot of people who just get ketamine. I've given well over a thousand doses of ketamine to people, for whom it's not really that much of a meaningful experience. I've had people say things like, well, my parents scrimped and saved to send me to medical school, and now I'm losing control of my thought processes during ketamine. I'm throwing away my parents' investment 
you know, that, you know, these kinds of scary thoughts, my, my organs are being ma- replaced with machine parts. <laughs> that sounds unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff like that. And that is not a productive insight and it's not healing. <laughs> it's not important for them to even remember that after the ketamine is worn off. So I would say the dissociation is clearly not a necessity in terms of producing attitude change and things like that. I would also say that some people, they get the ketamine. And I once had a, treated a guy, or it, wasn't, it was a research study, but I gave him a dose of ketamine. He had come from a Mormon background. He had never had coffee. He had never had tea, never had alcohol, never smoked, never used any drug. And, and he described ketamine as the most fun he ever had since he arrived at Yale. So it was like a roller coaster of like doing all these things. I mean, it clearly has that part to it as well. So the question is, is dissociation telling us something important? And I think there are ways that it does on my side of the street, which is that as I've mentioned, it just so happens that the dose of ketamine that is optimal for inducing the antidepressant effects is for many people the dose at which they experience dissociative symptoms. The dose that produces therapeutic effects, the dose that produces dissociation overlap. So that if you're giving a dose of ketamine that is, is not producing any dissociative symptoms, for some people it will mean you have underdosed the ketamine. Hmm. I mean, there are exceptions to this in that some people are just not very sensitive to the dissociative effects of ketamine, but still get the antidepressant effects. And examples of those people are people who have a personal or family history of alcohol use disorder, who seem to have a built-in tolerance to the effects of ketamine, as they do have a built-in tolerance, some of them, to the effects of alcohol. And that's another story we can get to if you want sometime. But what my colleagues... Irina Estoldis and Sophie Holmes and, and the broader group of collaborators with the Yale Pet Center did a study, which I think is incredibly important and interesting related to the Neurobiology Academy, which sheds light a little bit on dissociation. And that is, they had previously reported that a subgroup of patients with relatively more severe depression had reductions in synaptic density. And you could show that with PET scans with using a, a molecular tag for synapses. And so, okay, so there are the, these depressed patients who have reductions in synaptic density. Great. So that so far, that could be relevant to translating the animal work to the human work. So you give a mixed group of depressed patients, some who have synaptic deficits, others who don't have synaptic deficits, and you give them a dose of ketamine. What happens? This paper was from this same group published this year. It turns out that the people who have synaptic deficits, which are the more treatment resistant, the more severely ill, more chronically ill, et cetera, et cetera, the more hardcore depressed patients, they get a dose of ketamine. They get an increase in synaptic density. And the more dissociative symptoms they get, the bigger the increase in synaptic density. And the bigger the increase in synaptic density, the greater their clinical improvement. Pilot data, really preliminary, but very interesting. So it suggests that in people who have synaptic deficits, that dissociative symptoms produced by ketamine can be a marker that you've got enough ketamine into the brain and you're triggering the therapeutic antidepressant effects. But what about those other depressed patients, the other half of the patients with depression who are getting ketamine? They don't have synaptic deficits. What happens to them? They get dissociation too. But dissociation in those patients is unrelated to their clinical response. And if anything, it's not really so meaningful, but there's a little bit of a trend that the more dissociation they get, the less improvement they get. Not meaningful, but maybe it's there a little bit. So so dissociation in these two groups of patients during ketamine means two different things. Yeah. In one, it's a signature of clinical improvement, and another, it's not. And what that highlights 
is really, number one, ketamine is doing different things because the people who don't have synaptic deficits are still getting clinical improvement overall, but they're not getting clinical improvement that's related to the restoration of structural connectivity. They don't have that kind of depression. They don't have the deficits in synaptic density and it's not regrowing. So what could it be?